Say you will. Can you hear me? Yeah. Right, thank you so much for inviting me, Sam. I'm so humbled and proud to be uh, here in front of you today to tell a little bit about my uh, journey over the last six or seven years. I know of all the people in this auditorium, I'm probably the last person you want to see in Lycra. But unfortunately, you will be subjected to that, so beware, cover your eyes if you have to. Um, I've got no conflicts of interest, so all you'll hear from me is my unbiased opinion based on uh, the research I've been doing and my personal experience of uh, implementing what, what I discovered during that research. Um, and I've learned quite a lot over the last six years, and one of the things is that if your mind is closed, it can be a real enemy. So I would encourage you all to really think about how open your mind is to various things that you might not have considered possible in the past due to the way you've been educated or the, the experience that you've had. Because sometimes some things turn out to be true that you might not expect. Um, so the batting order today is, I'll tell you a little bit about who I am and then a little bit about heart attack and medication. Something on triathlon, um, a little summary of, about what I've I think now is the, the sort of makeup of a healthy lifestyle, if you like, and then you can embarrass me at the end of the question, but I probably won't be able to answer. Um, th that <laughs> card was, uh, I was supposed to do this lecture in 2020, and I was actually 60 then, and that was my children's idea of a joke, but uh, <laughs> it's probably quite true, actually. Um, and my journey's been very much one of enlightenment, empowerment, and hope. Uh, we've heard the word hope quite a lot, and I think that's an important part of the recipe. Um, enlightenment is in so much I did a lot of research and I, I learned an awful lot of things that I didn't know. And the empowerment side of it, I think, was I took control um, over my own health. I, I, I owned my own health rather than delegating it to a third party because we all know our own bodies better than anybody else. I think that's quite important. And so the journey take, takes me from a heart attack. The guy on the left there, in, in hindsight, you could see he was on the way to a heart attack. But at the time, I couldn't. Um, and obviously, the, the journey took me to the right-hand picture, which um, is a, a much more healthy individual, I suggest. Um, now, my background, I started out as an engineer. I very, very much look at the human body from an engineering perspective. I don't look at it like a clinician. Uh, and I think that's a very powerful uh, perspective. It's a very different perspective to a clinician. Uh, and we tend to see things in a bit more from a common sense point of view, a more logical point of view, than getting involved in the nitty gritty of some of the, the names of enzymes and, and various processes and stuff. And I think that's a very powerful thing. And I, I've dropped back onto that engineering experience a lot during this journey. Um, and after I'd done a bit of engineering, I joined the Air Force with some wild aspiration to be an astronaut. That didn't happen, obviously, but I, I did fly around in, uh, in the C-130 for quite a long time. And once that time was done, I moved my way into the civilian sector um, and was a captain of Virgin Atlantic Airways. So I may well have taken some of you on your holidays at some point if you've flown with Virgin. Um, but perhaps the most important aspect, I had a parallel academic career where I was doing all the flying. Um, and at the time of the heart attack, I, ha I had access to um, any literature that I wanted through the university library system. I had a research post. And that proved to be quite invaluable because lots of stuff that you really need to read is often hidden behind a paywall of some sort. So it was really helpful that I could access this information at will. So the, the journey started in Cape Town on Christmas Eve in 2014. Um, Captain Royal there with his little hat and ears uh, welcomed aboard all the excited people going back to Britain before Christmas. Uh, little did I know that would be the last time I would ever fly an aeroplane again. Um, so <laughs> it was a bit of a shock. Um, now the, the, the sort of way things panned out was I was in Cape Town, I didn't feel particularly well, but I didn't think I was about to have a heart attack. So obviously I flew the aircraft back, um, went to, to sleep, it was Christmas day, I went to sleep five hours. When I got up, I felt like I'd been in a boxing match. I felt really beaten up. Um, but because it was Christmas day, I pressed on, but I knew there was something not quite right. So I booked an appointment with the GP as soon as the surgery opened after Christmas. Uh, and the guy was quite perceptive, really, but I told him what the symptoms were. He said, you need to go to A&E. And I went, okay, I'll, I'll go tomorrow. I've got a quiz on tonight. 
and I'm a science and maths expert. Um, and he said, well, that's fine, but that might be the last quiz you ever do, unless you go now. And he thought, oh, I'll take a hint. And <laughs> off I went to Swindon. Uh, and sure enough, they ran the tests. And a lovely Irish doctor came in with, with my ECG and I looked at it and I went, oh, that's nice and, that's nice and regular. And he said, well, it's nice and regular. He's right. And he said, it's nice and regular, sir, but that fits upside down. <laughs> well, so we're going to have to run some more tests. So they ran the troponin test, and sure enough, I had a heart attack. And they estimated that I had it whilst I was asleep on Christmas morning. Now, that was a real shock. For a pilot to hear that they've got a heart problem is a real shock. And sure enough, it stopped my career dead. Um, and the reason was, you can see on the picture there, the pre and post pictures, was an ob obstruction of the circumflex coronary artery. It was 97% blocked, but pretty much nothing was getting to that part of the heart. Um, and after, after the stent had been fitted, you, you can see, the, but the, the floodgates opened along this bit, and obviously this part of the heart was, was resupplied. Um, and the, the three other blockages, one in the LED and, and a couple of other ones that weren't quite bad. But the general state of my heart was not good. Um, and there was some debate while I was lying on the, on the slab there as to whether I should have one stent, two stent, three stents, or some sort of bypass surgery. And I was glad to be awake for that discussion uh, because my, my um, cardiologist was talking to another cardiologist I could listen to what they were saying. And I, we all sort of agreed that let's just put one stent in and see how it goes. And I'm really glad that decision was made. Um, now when you've had a heart attack, you end up on a, a cocktail of drugs. Those are the ones I was putting on. I think if anybody's had that sort of heart incident, you'll find them on that type of medication. So you've got the beta blocker, uh, the angiotensin, um, the inhibitor, which uh, those two things basically affect your blood pressure and, uh, and your heart rate to some extent. But the clopidogrel was just to stop the stent being the focus for some sort of clotting incident. Uh, aspirin thins the blood a little bit, and it's obviously an anti inflammatory. And the bottom one, obviously, is the statin, which is there to bust the cholesterol. Um, and so I, I set up on that medication thinking that was perfectly fine, perfectly reasonable. Um, and then we went to, um, after you've had these sort of events, they offer you some sort of um, environment where you can meet other people who just have the same sort of experience and you work out, um, you do a little bit of exercise and it's just a supportive environment as you recover from a heart attack. Um, most people in this little group I was in were much older than me and at one point we went round the, the group with our aspirations, what, what's your goal now that you've had this setback? And John in the corner said, oh, I just want to be able to walk the dog around the block. And Bill in the corner said, I just want to go up the stairs and not be out of breath. And of course, what are you going to do, Tony? I said, well, I think I'm doing a little Mr. Strathlon. And there's a lot of guffawing around the room, saying, well, yeah, you're right, yeah, right. And I don't know if I was in denial or delusion or just being stupid, but I, I planned to do this way before the heart attack. So I thought, well, let's just keep it on the table as a possibility. And so rather than mope around, I set up about training for middle distance triathlon. I know there's a few triathletes in the audience, but for those of you not familiar, the middle distance is sort of the next one below a full Ironman. Uh, and it's 1.9 kilometers swim, 90 k on the bike and a half marathon, which is not an insignificant challenge actually. It's about six or seven hours of exercise. Um, and I was doing quite well for a couple of months. I was, training was going well, but then I was out on my bike one day and the handlebars snapped, and in the triathlon positions were sort of all the weight on the front, and so as soon as they snapped, I went straight out of the front of the bike. Uh, and my head and shoulder and right arm hit the, the tarmac at about 20 miles an hour. And you can see the damage there on the left. Obviously that was underneath my uh, helmet. The helmet was in four pieces. I would have died without the helmet. Um, the middle picture is my right arm here, and it was actually as big as my thigh with all the swelling. My elbow was up near my shoulder. It was quite a, a nasty fracture. And the bottom is obviously the repair that the brilliant orthopedic surgeons did to put me back together again. So I def definitely needed some of um, Campbell's <laughs> acute intervention at that point to put my arm back on. Um, but not only did that cause a setback to the training, it also added some more drugs to my list. And I ended up on, on nine, because obviously the pain relief was quite important because it was quite a painful injury. Um, and I had a medicine cabinet just full of drugs, so I, I, dutifully, I dutifully took them all. Um, 
Now, because I'd had the axes, I couldn't train for six weeks while well, they, they aren't repaired. But then once that had sort of fixed itself, I started training again, but delayed the race. I found another race that was two months later. Uh, and sure enough, I managed to enter that race and get round it, but I was last in my category. They split triathlon results up into their age groups, and I was last in this local race. And I, I sort of didn't recover. It was, it was really strange. Normally you'd have a day or two feeling a bit, a bit achy and stuff, but I just never recovered from that race. And I thought, oh shit, you really, pardon the language, I, you know, you've really done too much and you, you pushed your body too far too soon. And then I started to lose energy. I didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't want to train. I had no libido. My legs ached all the time. I had headaches and a general sort of ill feeling. Uh, and then I started to lose my mental faculty. I, I teach a lot of maths, physics and chemistry. And I had an A-level student ask me a very basic mathematical question. And I couldn't even understand the question, let alone give them an answer. And at that point, I got really, really down. Um, and a bit like um, Abby yesterday, I sat on the end of the bed in tears, thinking I'm either dying or I need to do something about this now. Um, and that was the sort of epiphany where, okay, get off your backside, pull yourself together, and see if we can sort something out. And um, just on the right there, you see what my cholesterol was at the time. It had been taken down from eight down to three millimoles per litre, which is quite low. Uh, perhaps something to cheer me up. I got an award at the Triathlon Club, coughing dodger of the year, which I thought was <laughs> very appropriate. <laughs> And that did make me smile as, as the sort of year came to a close. Um, but then the awakening began. Uh, I thought, well, I'm either dying of something, maybe not just the heart, maybe it was something else fundamentally wrong, or was it the drugs? Um, and, and so I gave myself a few questions to answer. What was making me feel so bad at that particular time? Why did I have a heart attack in the first place? Why was I pre-diabetic? Why was I obese? And what was there a solution I could find that would return me back to some sort of good health? Uh, and that quote there from Martin Luther King, you know, I was sincerely ignorant and I'd been stupid about understanding my own health. I was very ignorant in, in this area at the time. Um, and I, you know, I nearly got the ultimate sanction for, for that ignorance. But 2016 began and I started a really intensive period of research and I really did, and it's hundreds of hours we're talking about, where I went into all the literature. And the more I read the literature, the more gobsmacked I was how it contradicted itself and it contradicted what I thought was true. A lot of the research I didn't think was particularly robust, a lot of the conclusions didn't really come from the data. A lot of it was epidemiological or surveys or really the sort of research was a bit a bit flowery to me. Uh, and, and so I started to focus on the technical side of the science, the biochemistry, the pharmacology, etc., to try and see if I could work out my own version of what might be the truth, rather than relying on somebody else's versions. After a while, I, I realized I needed to, to get, get off the drugs to see what happens. And the, the statin was the obvious target from what I'd done. And I, so I decided, right, let, let's. Let's stop taking the satin and see what happens. And sure enough, within a couple of weeks, I started to feel remarkably better. Um, now, during that research, I came across the melanoma pathway. I'm not going to get technical in this uh, talk, so don't worry about the names. But <coughs> look at the bottom line there. If a production engineer had come up with this solution to a problem, they would have been sacked on the spot. Because you, the problem, the problem child is allegedly the cholesterol. Uh, but if you come in here with some sort of resolution to it, you, you interrupt all of these things either side before you get to the thing you're trying to target and all the things below it. So if this is a production line in a factory, you'd be bankrupt because you just screwed up the whole biochemical pathway in this case. And so I started to look in more depth at what was at the end of these pathways and tied them into the symptoms I was feeling. And the first one was coenzyme Q10. And when you realize how important that is in the electron transport chain, which is part of the process for the cell to generate energy, you can instantly see why your muscles might be aching, or why you might not have a problem with your energy levels. Dolichol is essential for the brain functions. 
So that made sense in terms I couldn't think straight. And then when you went below cholesterol, bioacids are part of the things that are made from cholesterol. And so maybe I was getting poor fat absorption, so my diet really wasn't what I thought it was. And then all the, the sex steroid type hormones are affected by this action, hence the low libido, endocrine imbalance, which probably made me feel a bit rough. And of course, vitamin D, which is essential for the immune system. So when I saw that diagram, I would, I, that was a real moment for me. I thought, this is it. This is what's causing the problem. And not only that, cholesterol itself, I found out, was absolutely essential to the body. It, it's the precursor for all of these other types of molecules, many more than I've got on the slide there. And so the thought of depleting my body of all these essential molecules didn't make any sense. It just was not sensible. And so I stopped the statins straight away. I felt better. And then I went to the cardiologist and said, look, I've stopped taking the statins. He had a bit of a pissy fit. And then I said, right, why did you give me the other thing in this cocktail? And, and the, the basic answer was that it's part of a statistical optimal combination of drugs from the research. But I said, well, there's nothing wrong with my blood pressure or heart rate before. Why am I taking it? And that was the reason. So I said, well, I'll, I think I'll stop taking those as well then. And so sure enough, I stopped taking the ACE inhibitors and the aspirin. The clopidogrel only works for 12 months anyway, the studies say. So I thought, well, I, the, the clotting issue's gone away, so I'll stop that as well. Um, and if you look at the beta blockers, you're not supposed to come off those straight away. So I did a phased sort of withdrawal of the beta blockers. And so after a period of a few weeks, I was now on zero drugs from nine. And I thought, this is great, this is great. But what do I do now? Because I still didn't realize about the cholesterol thing. So I still thought my cholesterol was a huge issue. So I started to delve into that. And then I came across, of course, Malcolm Kendrick's The Great Cholesterol Con. And my isn't it a con? I was, I was quite taken aback when I started to read into cholesterol itself. And I, I wasn't the only person. There's people like George Mann, who was in the Framingham study. He was a professor of biochemistry, and he said that, you know, what you can read there, the diet heart hypothesis that suggests high intake of saturated fat and cholesterol causes heart disease has been repeatedly shown to be wrong. And yet, for complicated reasons of pride, profit, and prejudice, the hypothesis continues to be exploited by scientists, fundraising enterprises, food companies, and even governmental agencies. The public is being deceived by the greatest health scam of the century. And I would concur with that, I think, now we the last century. So that's cholesterol. It's a very complex molecule. It's got those three hexagonal rings and a pentagonal ring. The black balls are carbons, the silver balls are hydrogens, and the, and the red one is oxygen. It's a beautiful structure. And I think, after my research, it's one of the most important molecules in the human body for health. And two of the things that really annoyed me when I found all this out was this good and bad cholesterol and this high cholesterol stuff. Because Good and bad cholesterol do not exist. Most people in this room probably know that, but most people outside here don't. And I really don't think it's helpful to keep perpetuating this myth that there are two types of cholesterol. I talk to doctors about this and they say, oh, we just do that because the patient won't understand if we tell them the truth. And I say, well, you're not helping because if somebody thinks there's something bad inside them, that, that gives them the incentive to take something to get rid of the bad thing. And cholesterol is not bad, it's just that molecule, and that's it. And so I try to encourage every doctor I speak to to change just even the words they use to explain the situation in terms of their pathology. And the, the high cholesterol thing, again, you've just, you've got this distribution of cholesterol in the general population. It's not exactly the shape of, I've, I've, I've put a standard sort of O-guy curve there, it's not as smooth as that in reality, but this will make the point. You've got this general distribution of cholesterol. Some people might have three, some people might have eight, but they're all normal on this distribution. They're not ill because of their cholesterol. And then people in white coats have got together in an office somewhere and decided arbitrarily to stick a red line on that graph and say, everybody to the right has now got high cholesterol. 
that they have not got high cholesterol. They've just got whatever cholesterol their body needs. If you're extremely out to the right with a familial hypercholesterolemia, that's a different thing, but these are few and far between compared to the normal population. And so by putting that line on that graph, they've suddenly made loads of people believe there's something wrong with their cholesterol. And when you step back and think what that means, what you're saying is there are millions and millions of people on this planet who have livers that are not capable of regulating the amount of an essential molecule in their bodies. And that's nonsense. You know, we're mostly healthy. Most people's livers work properly. And therefore, their liver will control the amount of cholesterol required at that time for that body. And by setting this system up, what they've done is allowed themselves a facility to provide a, a drug, a very cheap drug, that they can use to bust the cholesterol so people's levels come back to their line, and then obviously reap the mass, massive, huge profits. And that is, to me, part of this cholesterol con. How is that perpetuated, is the question. How can they get away with it for so long? They've got away with this for decades. I think Noam Chomsky sums it up very well in that quote from the, the, the common good. The smart way to keep people passive and obedient is to strictly limit the spectrum of a acceptable opinion, but to allow a very lively debate within that spectrum, even encourage a more critical and distant view. That gives people a sense that there's free thinking going on, while all the time the presuppositions of the system are being reinforced by limits put on the range of the debate. And in plain English that means that you can do what you like, you can say what you like, you can argue, you can research, you can publish papers, as long as you comply with the basic criteria of what they want you to think is the truth. So as long as you buy into cholesterol causes heart disease, saturated fat causes heart disease, LDL causes heart disease, if you buy into that, you can have whatever debate you like. You'll get funded, you get published. As soon as you step out of that, you get vilified. You're not, you, you know, you get marginalised. So that's how they control it. And if you touch out as a holistic practitioner, until you realise how easy it is for your mind to be manipulated, you remain the puppet of somebody else's game. And that's what's happening. Many of our healthcare professionals are puppets of big farmers' game. And I know it's difficult for some people to accept that they've been fooled, but this is what's gone on. And somehow we need to break this cycle. Because once we break it, we're going to solve the problem. But this is what we're up against. If you, if you look in the papers any, any day, you're going to get this type of headline. Because the press, the press is it under the same influence as the education system, as the research funding, all the other aspects that are seen talked about this morning. And this is the programming that the general public gets, so that when they get the information, they think it's the correct information. So it's all bought off. That's how it's done. So going back to me, um, after 2016, I was in a position where I felt confident to start a ketogenic diet. Um, and I implemented it in the January. Um, and throughout that year, I used it as a year of data collection for me, but for my personal body. I did stress tests with cardiologists. I worked with Bath University at the Leap uh, Training Centre there to get some data on my aerobic performance. I worked with lipidologists. And all the time I was doing races and noticing how much fitter I was getting as an athlete. And obviously, Asim is one of, one of the doctors who actually understood what I was trying to achieve. And his support was invaluable during this phase because you do question Am I, am I, have I got this all wrong? Because everybody else is telling me the opposite. It's very hard to sort of see this through without people like a scene just supporting you. Say, yeah, carry on with it, carry on with it, see how you get on. Um, and so what was I eating my keto doing? Like, well, you'll all be familiar about the type of stuff people eat. It's wonderful food. Um, I won't list what I was eating because you all know the types of things we have in our food. But the macro balance, just for your interest, I went for 60% of calories from fat 25% from proteins and just 15% from carbs. And I limited the carbs to sort of the blueberries and the leafy green vegetables. That was pretty much how I, how I ran it. So it was a high good fat diet, a very high cholesterol diet. Salt, again, I don't think the, the, the stuff we hear about salt is correct. 
Um, and because I was exercising so much, I didn't skimp on the salt when I was cooking. Um, obviously moderate protein and, and quite low carbohydrate. Um, and the, the dead sort of data gathering I was doing, um, this is a, a graph I plotted from a 12 hour fast, jumping onto the turbo trainer, doing 40 kilometers, and every 30 minutes pricking my finger to measure the glucose level and the ketone level. And I really wanted just to get a feel, because I was planning to do everything as a, as a low carb athlete, I wanted to get a feel for my, how my body worked, what was the interplay, the dance between these two variables. And, and you can see that, obviously when I started the morning, my glucose was quite low, to 3.8, and it, it slowly went up, slowly went up, but not extremely, and the ketones, as the exercise went on, as my fat oxidation got better, the ketones would rise and sort of take over, to some extent, from the glucose. And this sort of data gave me the confidence that my body was getting better at beta oxidation and that it could provide my body with the fuel it needed to do the sort of events I was planning. Now I had a few obstacles to negotiate. I got a cyst on one of my knees, which was quite painful. Um, a young lady lost control of a car and nearly killed me in a car accident and I broke a couple of ribs. Um, and I also chipped a bone, which was quite painful in my foot. But interestingly, with that chipped bone, I was, I was determined not to take any medication whatsoever, not even a painkiller, absolutely determined. So I went to the hospital because I knew I'd broken my foot, and they did the x-ray for me, and they said, okay, we'll put you in plaster or a boot or whatever. And I said, well, no, I've got a half marathon to run in a couple of weeks. <laughs> and they just laughed, they said, well, you can't do a half marathon with a broken toe. And I said, well, I'll give it a go, I'll give it a go. <laughs> and so I turned up to Cardiff, on the, I had to beat one of my sons, actually, in the race, that's why I did it. <laughs> But I, I ran the Cardiff Arc in under two hours with that broken bone a couple of weeks after breaking it with no pain relief. And this just told me how resilient our human bodies are, what they can tolerate if you put your mind to it. It's not about what the body can't do, it's about can you believe that you can do it. And once you get that belief, you'll be surprised what our body can do in response. But the bad news was my award wasn't so flattering in 2017 <laughs> when I took the, the smallest lunchbox award. Which I'm not sure that I've got the pictures of all the other athletes and I'm not sure that was the case. <laughs> now, of course, I was always bashing against the medical profession because I was very much out on a limb here. And these are the sort of comments I was getting from various medical professionals. And they're all understandable to some extent. I'm not criticising them here because this is what you would expect to hear from a GP or a cardiologist because of the way they've been educated about this subject. So I was told that my cholesterol will go through the roof. You're going to have problems with your weight. You're going to make your heart disease worth, worse and you're putting your life at risk by following the path you are following. Um, I didn't like this one so much. Are you seriously telling me you think you know better than all the experts? Well, when I was talking to Racine, I, it, it, it's surprising, but when you've spent so many hours researching a very niche area of medicine, you do end up knowing more off the top of your head than many doctors would know, because doctors are so broad, particularly GPs, they have to know so much, they can't focus in on this one topic. And so you do become more of an expert. And so I was a bit, well, a bit put off by that one. But, you know, you've got everything back to front, you're doing everything the wrong way around. And a lot of them were saying, you've got to get back on the statins, you've got to get back on the statins. Uh, and the quote there is just, I, I felt this wall appear in front of me that, you know, you're not playing the game, Tony, with, with sort of keeping your arm's length. And, well, what happened to my body is an important thing. And this is one of the most important slides you'll see today, as far as I'm concerned. So my weight, instead of going out, went from 15 stone to 11 and a half stone, so I lost 50 pounds. That was over about five and a half months, I think it was. My waist went from 38 to 30. Total cholesterol down from 8.2 to 6.5. HDL up from 1.6 to 2. LDL down. Triglycerides, which was, I thought was wonderful, down to 0.65 from 1.26. And the trig HDL ratio. Now, again, if you go to a GP, they're taught to, to focus on total cholesterol and LDL. They're the main metrics that they look at in a lipid, uh, if you do, if, to get a lipid test. 
And those are the two that I don't bother about because I don't think the total cholesterol is relevant to anything. I think the body will have the amount of cholesterol it needs at that time to function properly. And the LDL, it, most people don't realise that's not actually measured. Generally in Britain, it's calculated using the free roll formula. And so it's not a measured parameter, that one. And also many people don't realise there are lots of different types of LDL. There's about half a dozen different types of LDL. And it's quite important to know the breakdown of the types when you're considering the potential impact of the LDL. And without that data, which you can't really get in Britain, it's very difficult to get a, an LDL spectrum analysis. I don't put much in the LDL figures. And I wasn't bothered whether the LDL went up or down. I didn't really mind. The ones I focused on were the HDL and the triglycerides. So I think those two things really give a sense of how efficient the body is working. I mean, you've got a lot of triglycerides floating around in your blood. It's an indication that something's not right, it's not efficient. And the LDL, the HDL, sorry, takes sort of takes the stuff back to the liver for reprocessing. And if that's higher, that means it's an efficient system together. And so the trig HDL ratio was what I was bothered about. Uh, and to see that fall from 0.79 to 0.33, gave me some sort of confidence that I was probably doing something right. And all this was achieved without any calorie restrictions, so I wasn't measuring calories at all. Um, I'd done a little bit more exercise than I'd done before. The reduced biorhythmic stress was because I'd stopped flying on board. And I think that was a key factor. I've got a feeling that that, that biorhythmic stress is one of the key things that caused me to get heart disease. Eating real food, obviously. You've seen the balance of LCHF no drugs, um, I was ignoring all of the, my, my sort of presuppositions about medicine in this area. I was trying to ignore everything I'd learned in the past and just go on what I was reading and, and how my body responded to what I was doing. Um, and I was just ignoring anything I thought was meaningless in terms of the science. And in terms of the sort of measured parameters, my blood, blood glucose was generally around 4.2 most of the time. Uh, blood pressure, that sat on the sofa around about 100 over 70. The beta hydroxybutyrate, which is the main ketone the body uses when you're on an LCHF diet, um, that was sort of generally around 1.1. Uh, it started off higher, but then as the body becomes more efficient, it sort of drops back. So that seems, that was pretty reasonable. Blood milestone weight, BMI of 22 and a bit, and the body fat was around about 18 to 19%. And when I, did, when I was racing, my body fat was probably down at 17. Um, pulse, 47, sat on the sofa. So I think most people would settle for those metrics in general. In terms of the stuff I did with Bath University, VO2 max is your body's ability to process oxygen. How fast can it process oxygen per kilogram of mass per minute? And it's a very busy slide, but just, just look at the yellow box, which is... That was my measured um, amount category. So if you look on the left in the little blue box, if I can find it, up here you can see my measured thing was 48.5. So I fell into this yellow box up here. Um, I'd managed to get my heart rate up to 180. Um, so the 220 minus your age wasn't really working for me because that would have been 160. Um, but it put me into the excellent category for my age for VO2 max. But interestingly, if you look down at the, um, at the uh, 18 to 25 year olds, you can see that for that level, I would have been above average for an 18 year old. And I really felt like that because I was actually performing athletically better than I had done as a, as a young man, which I found quite extraordinary. And of course, that was the response I got when Tony Roll presented himself to various people. He said, look, this is me, look at me, look what I've done. And this was, this really wound me up because this is why I'm still here today. Because I think that as a rational human being interested in science, if you had a patient come in and, and present with these sort of metrics, you would say, let me know, tell me how you've done that. I need to learn something because this is contrary to everything I've ever been taught. I would sit them down and grill them until I understood what they had done. But that wasn't what they wanted. They were very congratulatory, very polite, but they just didn't want to know how and why I'd done it. And that's when I thought, you know, this has got to change because 
other people need to have this opportunity, this alternative to the medical route, the allopathic route. Hence my mission. Well, I could have got really frustrated and thought, no, I'm going to really put, put this to bed now. I'm going to show you what this body can do, even though it's had a heart attack and heart disease and pre-diabetes, etc. So I, I booked in for an Ironman. Um, and I decided I was going to do it as a fat-burning athlete. So there's two ways of doing the Ironman. You can go as a car burner, where you're continually stuffing glucose, basically fructose, whatever. Or you can do it as a fat-burning athlete, where you, you take a minimal amount of carbs uh, and rely on burning your own body fat over the time. Um, and now, if you, if you don't know what an Ironman is, those are the parameters there. And to put that into context, it's like swimming 156 lengths in the local pool in Bristol, getting on a bike, cycling to the middle of London, running the London Marathon. So it's a big day at the office. It's not something to take lightly. Um, and so, I knew I was going to have to have a body like that. So, uh, sorry Sam, it's always got to come up like that. <laughs> now, I'm never going to look that good, but that was my target shape. Um, and this is when I bumped into the PHC. Um, and I went to the PHC meeting in 2018, and I, I was so inspired by the people there. It was Tim Nopes, who just went to case, Zoe was there. Peter Brookman from Australia, Ian Lakers here today, I think speaking later, Trudy's spoken today, Ivor is very similar to me in many ways because of our backgrounds, uh, the only of course in the sea, uh, many more people. It was just such an uplifting experience because I felt I found my family at last, people who understood what I was saying and didn't treat me like some sort of, some sort of freak, which, which was a lot of the response I was getting. And so this was a very important time and it happened just before I took on the event and it gave me great confidence that I could do this. Um, and I, people say, why do you want to be a PhD senior master? This is why. Because the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch them without doing anything. And we have got to do something because we know the way to do it. So please, please, if you're I'm in an hour about being an ambassador, don't do it. And then learn your stuff, whatever your thing is, and then speak your truth and then make a difference. And that's how we're going to turn this around. It's up to us. It's not going to happen, you know, just because somebody else will do it. We have got to do it. And that's me at the Wiltshire Diabetes and Obesity Summit. I was invited as a guest speaker, the alternative guest speaker. And it was a, <laughs> the sea of faces. It's not like your faces. It was. <laughs> yeah, they could not believe what was coming out of my mouth and, and that's how it is but you know don't expect it to be easy because you know the further we drift from the what is the reality and the truth the more that you will be criticized for actually telling people that truth that's just how it is but going back to the Ironman which is, was an interesting race it, it was the time when the, the moors were on fire just in the north of there. and so <laughs> that was the bike course and so they had to cut it short, so I did the swim, but on the bike, modified route, um, and I finished about 15 hours. I burnt about three pounds of body fat, um, and this was just under 1,300 days after I had the heart attack. Um, but of course, <laughs> there was unfinished business because the bike short had been, the bike route had been cut short by about 15 miles, so I had to do another one. <laughs> so, so the next year I did it all again in Germany, um, slightly quicker. It was hot, 32 degrees. It's really hard running a marathon in 32 degrees any day, but that day it was hard work. Um, and so I've got two Ironman events out of my way, but I really, I'm, I'm not putting this stuff up to blow my own trumpet. I'm putting this stuff up so you realise that this, the extent, the order of magnitude of the change in my health. So during that year, when I did the Ironman Hamburg, I did four 10 kilometer proper races. I did three half marathons standalone. I did a 20 mile race, I did a full marathon on its own, four sprint distances, three Olympic distances, two half Ironmans, and the Hamburg event. And obviously you've got to train for all this and recover from all this. That's what my body was capable of in 2019. And the icing on the cake. I got a, an unexpected email from uh, Ironman Foundation saying that I'd made the top 10% for my age in the world. Oh, wow. <laughs> To make me feel even better, 
the cardiologist said, look, we need to have a look at your heart because this, this isn't right. You're, you shouldn't be able to perform that. <laughs> and so they did a, a free uh, fractional flow um, CT scan. And that's pretty normal, I think, for, for one of those. If you look at them online, you'll see lots of red lines. Because if it drops below sort of eight, seven and a half, you start to get uh, indications that it's narrowing to an extent where you might need to do something. But that was, if a cardiologist saw that, I think, yeah, that's fine for an old heart. That's what they look like. And the realising that I actually managed to scrape into the Great Britain team for my age to represent my country. And that was something I'd always wanted to do and I never thought I'd get there, but anyway, that was the year of 2019, which was unbelievable. Um, and just to round home the, the drug thing, I had no illness from the 16th of November, 2016, until this February, when I got sin sinusitis. And, it, and then I took some painkillers because it was quite a painful dose of sinusitis. But between that date and that date, I didn't have a common cold, didn't have a headache, didn't take even a paracetamol. That's nearly 2,000 days without any illness or any medication. And I, I just couldn't believe it because I don't think, if you ask anybody in the street, you, they, you will not get that reply when the last time you took a painkiller. It'll be last week. And so this is the power of the ketogenic diet and a change in lifestyle. So that's me on the National Nutritional Guidelines, looking really happy but rather large. And that's me on a ketogenic diet. Which one of those looks like a healthy individual? That was me running the Cardi Bar before I started the keto diet, compared with after. I'm nearly 40 minutes faster for a half marathon. And that time, 144, put me in the top 2,000 in the Cardi Half Marathon of all competitors. Out of 25,000 people, I was in the top 2,000, beating all these youngsters. So that's how fit my body had become by 2019. Um, I just think this is a really powerful demonstration of what you can do with your body if you treat it right. So this is the $64,000 question, so what, what are the factors that are promoting health there? And this is what I've come up with after, after the last six or seven years. We should eat organic, fresh, local food, which doesn't leave us deficient in anything. And that's deficient in minerals, vitamins, fats, or the amino acids um, that are essential, as Trudy described earlier on. I think we should drink pure water, either, either spring water or even you know, condensed distilled type water. Natural roots rather than fizzy things, these are all obvious. Clean, fresh air. And you'll notice all of these things are uh, eliminating toxicity, because I think that's the key. Now, engaging with nature is important. Get out there, get in the fresh air, hug a tree, just be with the planet. That's important to our well-being, I think. Absence of radiation, so turn your Wi-Fi off, avoid mobile phone in the pocket all the time, it's turned on. We've got 5G coming, so steer clear of that. Just minimise your exposure to radiation. Don't live under a power cane, that type of thing. Engage in constructive habits. One of those is physical exercise, but fasting is important. I did a lot of fasting when I was doing the keto stuff. Yoga for your flexibility and meditation linked in with that. Just for your mental well-being. Engage with your own spirituality. Realise who you are and what you're capable of. Try and engage in a meaningful ed education, because a lot of our education is prescribed for us by curriculum. If you have a curriculum, it's normally got a vested interest that drive what you're being told. That's not meaningful education. Engage in things that you're interested in, do your own independent research and come up with your own version of the truth and then speak it. And all of the time, our mental state is so important. There's so much mental illness in this world at the moment. We need loving and enriching relationships. We need uplifting emotions, not ones that drag us down. And we need to be thinking positively. And I think if you put all of that together as best you can, you get this type of transformation in a sick body to a healthy body. Um, and I was supposed to talk about sort of heart disease specifically, but broader health issues, and what is my view now on those things? And I think, you know, out there there's a perception that, that heart disease is inevitable, that thousands of people get it every year, and it's just going to happen. And that once they've got the, the heart disease, that there's only one pathway out of it, and that's the allopathic pathway of taking the drugs. And then the best you can hope for is you'll stave off the inevitable degradation in your health over time. That's the general perception of how heart disease goes. But it doesn't need to be like that. And I hope that one thing I've proven is that there is a, 
an alternative you can consider. I'm not saying it will work for everybody, but it's an alternative that should be given to people when they, they get this bad news about heart disease, because it's very devastating. And if you've got a few choices to make, you might find a few people who will go down the same route as I have. Um, but you know, I think the worst thing we ever did probably as humanity was put responsibility for our health into the hands of people who make profit from sickness. That was the dumbest thing we ever did. And I don't criticise the pharmaceutical companies or the food companies, because they are just making profits. That's what they are there for. It's our fault for allowing them to infiltrate our education systems, particularly the education systems of our doctors and nurses, our nutritionists, our dietitians. This education critically needs to be divested, split apart, from the pharmaceutical companies, the big food companies. We need to do independent education, independent research, independent publications, etc., etc., so that we get a real feel for the truth. And I think if we did that, we wouldn't have the situation we've got now where all our wonderful healthcare professionals are fighting fires day in, day out. They're tired, they're, they're just fighting the fires, and the fires are getting stronger and more frequent and more often. And we haven't got the resources. So the, that's not the solution. All of this research into, oh, what causes it? What the, that's not worth anything against stopping it in the first place. And it will stop if we get the education right and people live the correct lifestyle. We won't have these epidemics of chronic disease. Um, and just to finish off, what I'm doing now is, I, I love being an ambassador, I'm very proud to be an ambassador for this organization. I will give any lectures and talks that people want me to do in that connection. I work with a local health care clinic, they pass people on to me, I'm working one to one, I've had a lot of success in a lot of areas. This diet seems to really help in a lot of areas of disease. And my goal going forward is to, uh, athletically is to qualify for the World Championships in 2024, so that's my goal athletically. I'd like to write a book about this story if I can get time, and um, I really want to break down this cognitive dissonance and the flawed dogma in medical and nutritional science and policy. That's me. If you've got, thank you so much for listening. If you've got any questions, please fire away. Right, question. Your hands on it. <laughs> most inspirational talk. It's absolutely wonderful. And I was a GP, as you know, I've been do I qualified as a doctor uh, 36 years ago. And um, I actually felt um, I didn't want to know about the great cholesterol con. It was a very strange thing. I'd been brainwashed by the drug companies. And when I heard about Malcolm's book, I actually really held back from reading it. And when I re read it patiently, went through it, and the scales fell away from my eyes. And I'd say that to any GP or nurse or any person who hasn't read it yet, read it. Um, I think it's absolutely amazing what you've done. It shows you what can be achieved. And I would say to anybody here that engineers make the best people to do keto. They really just look into it. Have you got any engineer patients? And if you're any engineers you know who do keto, please become an ambassador. <laughs> Um, I got a question on your metabolic performance. Um, you, you mentioned, I think it was three pounds that you uh, um, utilized to bottle bodily fat whilst running. Did you actually find that you got to your metabolic edge? That means you were pushing your body harder than you were able to metabolize your either dietary fat or bodily fat. And how did you kind of calculate what your metabolic edge was? Yeah, I, you do that. I did it by feel anyway, but um, when you're oxidizing fat, you can't oxidize it very quickly. So if you have a, a, a period of intense exercise, such as a hill on the bike, for example, if you just tackle it and you're in this metabolic sort of homeostasis of just churning over, you won't cope and your performance falls off. So what I did there was anticipate, I did a record of the course, anticipate that the exertion for say five minutes away and then I'd eat a banana or some, some, carb, some carbs just prior so I could get those into the system just as I hit the hill and then I had ready glucose available. 
Now the problem comes is that in that your, your glycogen is slowly being dumped from your muscles and from the liver, and there comes a point when that is pretty much gone. That's the real point when it starts to hurt, because then you are just burning this fat, you've got the lactate problems, you've got no glycogen to just go up a hill when you're running. And so that makes the marathon very, very challenging. Uh, and so there's no way I could sprint in the, any section of the marathon. But I was able to cope with the bike by just using that technique. And, and you sort of get a feel, when you've done enough training, you feel these things <laughs> physiologically, you just tell that you're reaching that point where you need to do something. So, so you were using a dual fuel strategy um, uh, to, to really get to the, the end of the to, to try and maximize my speed, I was, I was using that strategy, yeah. And I think I took on about 3,000 calories in carbohydrates during the event. But most of them, like 10,000, probably came from my body, I would imagine. It's hard to measure it because of the hydration problems and the weight measurements. I probably should have done some caliper things, but I didn't get around to that, but yeah. Uh, thank you for a beautiful presentation and for your story. My name is Gosia, and by, by my, my background, I am a nutritionist. And personally, nearly 30 years on very low carb, very high, even higher than you diet in, in fat, sometimes 85%. <laughs> uh, now, I have one question because maybe three months ago, I decided to eat more fruits and more vegetables because I started to have uh, severe cramps. Yeah. What about electrolytes? Do you take electrolytes or your intake of vegetables, this 15% of carbohydrates, allows you to avoid taking uh, electrolytes when you are fasting and having uh, physical activity? Else? That's a very, very good question because electrolytes are critical in the cells, the way the cell generates power, the potassium, the calcium, the magnesium, the sodium particularly, all of these things you've got to have enough of them. I think the body stores them away in nice places where it can grab them if it needs them. But when you're doing these extreme type of sports, you definitely have to be very aware of your electrolytic balance. And so I, I was taking on electrolytes during the whole of the Ironman to make sure I always had enough available. And the problem comes towards the end when you, you lose track of what you've taken on board and what you haven't. And as you go past the feed stations, you're saying, shall I have electrolytes or shall I have glucose or shall I have water? Um, and so it's, it's a juggling balance. It's, it's another discipline in itself, the nutritional side of, a, of a, an Ironman. Uh, but ordinarily, when I was just doing the keto stuff, I didn't really supplement on anything. I just made sure I got a good balanced diet, and that should contain all of those minerals and vitamins. The only, only vitamin I ever supplemented was D3 in the winter of in the Northern Hemisphere. Thank you very much. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask you, um, I've heard several people say not to over-exercise, and um, I know some, some people, like myself, are a bit addicted to exercising. Did you notice any stresses on your body whilst you can, whilst you're exercising, and how long did you take to recover before you would start another um, rest? Well, this was what surprised me the most of the, all of this was my ability to recover. I could literally run a half marathon one day, and the next day it was as if I'd done nothing. Whereas in the past, I was, I'd been on the sofa for a week recovering. It was extraordinary ability to recover. Now I did use massage, so I had a massage therapist who saw me through a lot of those intense periods of training. Um, uh, but I think you're right about the amount of exercise. I don't think the sort of exercise we're doing in 2019 is healthy, really. It was just I was trying to achieve a goal, and I, was accept I accepted the downside on my body for that year. But I wouldn't recommend anybody use that level of intensity, unless you're a professional athlete, you know, for, for more than a, a few weeks or months. Um, and so this is why this year I'm having a bit of a downtime, to let my body completely recover and, uh, and then go again. Tony, that was, that was brilliant. Oh, um, yeah. That was re really brilliant. And um, as I was listening to this, two, two things. You're appealing to people that want to fix a problem. And also it's about performance, um, which, which will appeal to another group of people. Um, I'm often thinking about how to deal with one, one decision maker and get for lots of people. And your background in the airline industry, and I don't know a huge amount about it, but I am aware that they are quite concerned about pilots not dying at the... Yeah. It's not helpful, but it hasn't the pilot dead. It's alright for me to have you just take over, but for you... <laughs> and also, um, as an air traffic controller, as well, I have to be quite alert, switched on. Yeah. Do you think there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a shared goal in there somewhere of taking the... This approach 
um, utilizing PHC and other methods and targeting the airline industry as a as someone who would actually potentially see the perceived benefits and then with people with inside knowledge of what their interests yeah. are. I think the hard thing with pilots is they enjoy a good lifestyle, don't they? Like, you see, when you're flying, you get all the upper class food that's not eaten. <laughs> and then when you get to the other end, you're desperate for a beer. So it's very hard to um, probably get them to conform to what you were trying to do to help them. Um, I mean, it'd be nice if all the pilots were, were fit and healthy. The, the perverse thing is that I'm not allowed to fly an aeroplane because I'm not fit and healthy enough. <laughs> but I know guys who can barely fit in the seat that they allow to fly because they just pass their basic medical. I just wonder instead of basic medical, if we just move it to a bit of, let's see what your metabolic health is and raise your awareness of what that means. Yeah, that would be, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Congratulations on everything you've achieved. Um, you. Thank you very much. That's a um, brilliant journey. Um, so I myself am also a bit from an engineering background, and um, certainly nothing to the extent you've done, um, but I sort of did my own research and sort of went diving into all the biochemistry and everything else that came um, with uh, metabolic disease and uh, the lifestyle that most of us here are probably leading right now. <laughs> Um, and in doing so, there was just something you mentioned about um, experts, I think, on a slide where you had a few questions or rhetoric questions or statements that were said to you. And I suppose it's just a comment really on it um, that I think we all kind of become experts in on ourselves through these journeys. Yeah. So we might not know the specific medicine or the dosage or the right exercises to do, but I think sitting across from somebody you through all of this, you become the expert on yourself. That's the key. That's a very key so, point, isn't it? You know your body the best. You can feel it. You know how it's responding. You know what you felt like in the past, what you feel like in the future. You've got the datums that you can relate to, whereas the poor old doctor's just got 10 minutes to make these massive decisions. So you, this is why I encourage people to take responsibility for their own health. That's such a powerful thing to do. I know many people are reluctant to do that because they haven't got this expertise, but they have got the expertise you just mentioned. Um, and I, and none, none of this stuff is beyond most people. And I never put any story on academic qualifications because it's how much you know and how you use that knowledge, how you employ your common sense to use that knowledge, that's the important thing. So I don't care what letters people have got before or after their names. What do you know, what, you, what can you tell me to help me on my journey and vice versa? That's the important thing. Fantastic. Round of applause for Tony. <laughs>